JP. Nice to see everybody. Everybody interested in new materials. Uh, so um, it turns out that this year, maybe somebody mentioned this already, but it's the uh, International Year of the Periodic Table. That's uh, pretty appropriate. Uh, 1869, uh, Mendeleev wrote down the first periodic table. And uh, so they're celebrating that all year. So lots of events. So uh, this is my group. Uh, we're located at the uh, in the building called the Joint Institute for Advanced Materials, and it's in a beautiful location actually. So we've got this beautiful river, and there's a greenway that runs along the river that's used with walking trails and running trails. So you get about five miles of, of running trails and stuff, and so plenty of parking and right on the river. So it's a pretty nice place to to hang out. And uh, the two people in blue here, Oscar is in the audience, and Amanda is the one uh, who made all the, the slides uh, on, on some of the technical details that I'll show later. All right, so uh, I like to say that we focus on digital synthesis of quantum materials, and uh, we use all of our digits to uh, <laughs> So that's just a little joke. So that hairy hand is actually the hand that Brian said. <laughs> Actually, at Oak Ridge, uh, this, this is something Oak Ridge Glass Shop did. They, we have a great glass shop at Oak Ridge. And, and they can make these enormous uh, sealed containers where you can put a big flat crucible inside. So having a good glass shop is actually pretty nice. So this is my favorite cartoon. Og discovered fire and Thorak invented the wheel. There's nothing left for us. So um, it's a joke, but, but there's some people out there who are, who are serious, like this guy John Horgan, who wrote a book called The End of Science. And, and he says, basically, science is over, and uh, there are no, no more revolutions or revelations. But, but uh, there's another way of thinking about this that goes to Freeman Dyson. And he divides the world into unifiers and diversifiers. And the unifiers want to write you know, everything in the universe in one equation that fits on a t-shirt. Uh, whereas people like us who make materials, they love to uh, in love with the heterogeneity of nature, and they want to leave the universe more complicated than it found it. So I think that's a healthier attitude overall. So that's, uh, I think most of us agree with that kind of a viewpoint. All right, uh, so you guys are new materials makers. So what is a new material? And in physics, uh, the definition is a lot looser than, than chemistry, I would say. Uh, so this would be more of a chemistry definition, a new combination of elements with a unique structure. But in physics, you know, like a known material which a new property has been discovered, like magnesium diboride, that was a new material, even though it wasn't a new material in some sense. But, you know, people jumped on it and studied it and regarded it as new. So, or maybe a known material which is chemically doped to produce new behavior, <coughs> right? Plus some magnetoresistance materials. Or a nanomaterial that shows surprising properties such as graphene that was considered a new material. Even the surface of a crystal, like a top logical insulator, that's new material. A crystal could be around forever, but you can find something new on the surface. All these are potentially new materials, so our, our definition is a little bit uh, more expanded. So, why would anybody want to make new materials for a living? It allows you to be problem-driven rather than technique-driven. This is one of the favorite, this is one of my favorite reasons, actually. Uh, this is. This is what, uh, this is, uh, I mean, theorists are allowed to be problem driven as well. Whereas if you have a fancy piece of equipment, you have to find something that you can use your equipment on. Um, so when, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So you want to avoid that if you can. You have lots of opportunities to be creative when you make materials. Uh, you get free instant gratification, uh, which is always good. You know, many times if things work out, you can start the problem, and at the end of the month, you've got most of the draft of a paper written. If things if things work out, they don't always work out. They mostly don't work out, but it's still fun. All right. So here's some advice for new materials makers. Six months in the lab can save you an hour in the library. <laughs> Lots of mistakes in the literature. So it might be wrong. Whatever they're writing could be wrong. Don't, just because it's printed in a nice glossy page doesn't mean it's right. If you have a good idea, almost certainly somebody else in the world has the same idea of working on it. You could almost bet on it. 
Science doesn't reward good ideas unless you do something with them. So just having the idea is enough. You have to do something. And go for the low-hanging fruit, especially when you're young. All right, what is the next foliable material? So this is... <coughs> Take a scotch tape and gently lay it down on a flat surface. Next, take clean metal tweezers and pick a thin graphite flake and then place this gently onto the scotch tape. Next, fold the scotch tape at the edge of the graphite flake. Peel it off gently and do this step several times until you obtain a nearly transparent region on the scotch tape. After this, take a clean silicon wafer to transfer the scotch tape graphene onto the wafer. Use plastic tweezers and gently rub <coughs> the area of the scotch tape where graphene may potentially be. Slowly peel off the scotch tape so as not to break any potential graphene sheets. Use an optical microscope to view and find graphene. Graphene appears as a purple spot on the screen. At the center of the screen is multi-layer graphene, and at the right corner, lower right corner of the screen, is single layer graphene. All right. Hello friends. Um, I'm back again today and I wanted Talked about how you can image them with the SPM. 
suffer from the title of the talk. But they're beautiful, smooth surfaces. Uh, some of the metal ions uh, are coordinated uh, trigonal prismatic, some are octahedral. So there's a, these are the common uh, polytypes. So the one stands for one unit cell, uh, one layer per unit cell. The P is tetragonal. Uh, this is two, two layers per unit cell. H is hexagonal. Three layers. R is rhombohedral. Uh, so these are octahedrally coordinated. These are just trigonal prismatic. So the structures are fairly simple. But just the stacking and everything changes the properties quite a bit. So in the last several years, uh, there's been a lot of high throughput computing where they've, uh, you know, calculated uh, electronic structures of lots and lots of uh, 2D materials. This is one of the earlier papers. Uh, but you can go on, there's whole libraries now where people predict things like cleavage energies. And you can find materials that cleave easily. They predict various ground states. So like here's a ferromagnetic. Top. So these are all a 2D limit, ferromagnet, any ferromagnet. So there's all, all kinds of interesting papers out there to look at. So the key thing to think about is that these exfoliable materials are really the bridge between bulk quantum materials and nanoscience. Right? Before these materials, it's very difficult to do nanoscience, except maybe cleaving a, a crystal and looking at the surface uh, with an SDM. But now, uh, our, our bulk materials can be cleaved down to few layer, single layer materials and really make huge impact on nanoscience, and especially with the new materials. And some of these thin materials, they have new degrees of freedom, like a, a layer number and uh, you know, valley degrees of freedom. And plus, they're very incredibly tunable. You can tune them with electric fields. You can tune them with strain. There's all kinds of ways to tune them. And so they're tunable with new degrees of freedom. And in the last couple of years, people have been thinking about magnetic properties. And so you can have a magnetic layer uh, with a Van der Waals gap. Um, an, an example of this kind of material, this is one we, we looked at a few years ago, chromium silicon tellurium-3. And uh, so this is a good example. This is a ferromagnet uh, semiconductor, very two-dimensional, cleaves easily. So you've got a layer of chromiums. These are silicon uh, dumbbells. That's why you'll often see these written as like, uh, like 226, is because you're trying to express the fact that you've got these silicon silicon bonds in there. So the goal of uh, a lot of the magnetism research is to, uh, you want to tune the magnetism with the gate voltage. If you guys want more, we wrote a little review article a couple months ago. It's only but, uh, so, and this is an example of somebody who successfully tuned uh, magnetism with a gate voltage. So this is the iron-3 germanium uh, tellurium-2 system. This is a 2D uh, itinerant ferromagnet. So they cleaved it down. Uh, I believe they used ionic liquid gating, and they were able to control the magnetism to some extent. And I think this is, last time I checked, about a month ago, it hasn't, hasn't been published. It's been on the archive for six months or something. So it made a big splash a couple of years ago uh, when, when uh, this, in this case, it was chromium germanium tellurium 3 was discovered to be a ferromagnet in single layer form. Um, I still think that the silicon would have been a better choice. But we'll see. They also, uh, there's also been a lot of work done on another system called chromium iodine 3. So uh, this is another ferromagnetic system. This has great optical properties. It's very, uh, it's a very stiff magnet. It's very, um, it has high porosity. So, um, so it's actually quite. So this is all done with uh, optical with MOC experiments. And so the difference between one layer, two layer, and three layers. So in one layer you get this nice hysteresis loop uh, with MOC. Two layers, it really looks like it, it goes from being a ferromagnet to being an antiferromagnet enough magnetic field you can kind of flip it. And then back to three layers. So this is this is a pretty interesting discovery. People are also looking at uh, uh, antiferromagnets. Here's an antiferromagnetic material, iron, phosphorus, sulfur, three. Some of the things people are looking at. 
So one thing we've been looking at um, is ruthenium trichloride, which is very close to a container of uh, spin liquid. And actually, if you put a magnetic field in the plane, it does produce some sort of spin liquid. We're not sure if it's decay or not, but it is, it is spin liquid. And uh, we've been working with a guy named Eric Hendrickson at Washington University in St. Louis, who's, uh, who's an assistant professor there. He's been doing some good stuff. And the first thing he did was that he, he realized that ruthenium trichloride is actually fairly stable in air in one and, one and two layers. And then very, very recently, what he was able to do was um, he, he put uh, exfoliated ruthenium chloride flakes and he stacked them on top of monolayer graphene. And basically what he observed was there was charge transfer from the graphene to the ruthenium trichloride. And so this is, this is actually a very important uh, discovery because it's, it's usually really hard to metallize some of these some of these systems. And so he's able to actually do charge transfer. And so he metallized the ruthenium chloride by placing it in, in uh, proximity to the graphene. And uh, so he was able to convince himself, and hopefully the referees, that um, there's signatures of multiband transport. And these are actually magnetic transitions here that you're observing uh, in the resistivity. Or in this case, it's the uh, derivative of the resistivity. So that's, that's a pretty interesting, fairly new result. Dave? Yes? What are the different curves there? <coughs> the, uh, these are different samples and different temperatures. Uh, different, uh, I can, we could go into the, uh, it, there's a lot of detail in that figure. And, uh, but yeah, he sees, there are, it's pretty, I can send you the paper. It's pretty interesting stuff, actually. Um, so, one, one observation that Abe Patsupathi made a couple of years ago was that as soon as you get away from semiconductors and you start looking at uh, narrow, narrow gap semiconductors and metals, the surfaces of, of these materials become rather unstable and they tend to form uh, amorphous oxide layers. Uh, and he observed this in many materials. And here's the case, this is like panel and disulfide. And so that, that becomes a problem when you want to make devices, right? If you have this amorphous oxide layer on top. And so what people have learned to do is to uh, cap. What you can do, so here's a case of niobium sulfur, uh, selenium-2, which is a superconductor. What they can do is put a piece of boron nitride on top of it and protect it from oxidation. And then they can do their measurements, right? So, that, so in this case, they're able to measure superconductivity of a single layer of niobium diselenide because they put this boron nitride cap on top and then did some fabrication. So that's the kind of technical stuff that has to be learned to make more progress in the field. Okay. So that's, you can do all kinds of stuff on the single layers. So you can also start interpolating these exfoliable, exfoliable materials. So here's an example. Um, so intercalation is the reversible inclusion or insertion of a molecule or ion into compounds with layered structures. And so, um, so here's an example of uh, potassium uh, carbonate that superconducts with a very low TC. So when years ago, uh, when C60 was discovered, so one of the first things R. Pepar did was to put potassium in it because he knew that uh, when you do it with, with, gra with graphite, you get a superconductor. So he said, well, we'll try it with carbon-60. And he got a uh, superconductor with 19 kTc. And so that was a huge result and uh, drove a lot of interest in it. But, uh, but that's why he did it right away. He knew to do that. Um, so here's another example. Uh, you've got this lithium X zirconium uh, nitride chloride. And uh, so this is another, this is a, when you lithium interpolate this one, it becomes superconducting. And we'll come back to this one in a little while uh, with non gating as you see. And so this one is also quite interesting. This is the uh, sodium X cobalt O2 system. So this has cobalt O2 layers separated uh, by sodiums. And uh, if you put, it turns out if you put water in between the layers, you can produce a superconductor. So that's kind of, that was kind of interesting. Uh, Calls is a, called it a watery superconductor. Um, 
So we did quite a bit of work on that. So ionic liquid gating is another technique that you can use uh, to, to do stuff with these materials. So the basic idea behind ionic liquid gating is you have an electrolyte, which is ionic liquid. It has positive and negative ions in the liquid. And the idea is that if you put a gate voltage, if you put a drop of liquid on your sample, so here's a semiconductor, here's a drop of liquid, you have a source, a drain, and a gate. So you put a gate voltage on, uh, you drive the ions in the liquid, so you say you put the positive plate, lay down the positive ions on top of your sample, negative ions near the gate here. So if you have all these positive ions sitting on top of your sample, you're going to attract electrons, and you can create a 2D electron gas at the surface of your semiconductor. That's the idea. Now, this cartoon, it turns out, isn't very good. Uh, real materials don't actually behave this way. So this is just a cartoon. In reality, what you do is chemistry. You, you end up, like, you can intercalate, you can intercalate things into your semiconductor. You can remove oxygen from materials. So it's a lot more complicated. It's possible that this cartoon works in some very simple systems, like tungsten disulfide. Even there, I wouldn't bet on it. It's always a lot more complicated than this picture in reality. People have learned that in the last three, four years. But you can still do some cool stuff with the ionic liquid gating. So here's that uh, zirconium nitride chloride material. And so this, this paper made a huge splash. So they put ionic liquid on top, and they were able to convert it uh, from an insulator to a superconductor by gating. So that was pretty cool. So now, in this case, uh, it's probably you're pushing some lithium into the system, but, but I'm not certain of that. So here's another uh, example where they took some uh, tantalum disulfide, which, is a, which undergoes a few charge density wave transitions, and they were able to tune those with different gate voltages. Um, so that's interesting. So they were able to get a whole phase diagram here, nearly commensurate charge density wave, and commensurate charge density wave. So that was Okay, interesting. So it turns out we tried some ionic liquid gating with ruthenium trichloride. We were trying to metallize it, and we failed. We, we ended up making it more insulated. So it didn't work for ruthenium trichloride. Um, so that was why we were so excited that they, we were looking at it. <laughs> Even though it didn't, it just made it more magnetic. It didn't make it a superconductor. It made it more magnetic. All right. So the other thing you could do uh, with exfoliable materials is stack them together different ways. Right? You can stack them up. And so here's an example where uh, they put graphene on top of yttrium iron garnet. Right? Yttrium iron garnet is a very magnet, uh, very used a lot in spectronics. And they put a piece of graphene on it. And what they did is they measured uh, an anomalous Hall effect in the graphene, showing that there was some magnetization uh, uh, from proximity effect in the graphene. That was nice. Uh, lately, people have been getting building more and more of these Van der Waals heterostructures. So what you can do is you can exfoliate different materials. You have a whole library of materials, and then you can stack them together any way you want. Um, and you can design materials from the ground up that way. And so this this is, idea has been around for a long time, a well, long time, maybe six years, and. Uh, People have gone with, so the, the original ones, you know, are these, these uh, easy, easy ones to work with, but people are working with uh, more interesting materials now. <coughs> Here's an example of what you need to do this. So this, uh, this is something that Jim Hohn built at Columbia, calls it, calls it the central stacking facility. Everything's done in the glove box. Uh, he's got a Raman microscope in the glove box. And people eventually want to have this all done with robots and everything. I don't know how viable that's going to be. But uh, maybe with enough money you can do it with robots. But this really, this didn't cost that much money. This is only about 100k or something, 200k. Um, but this is a, if people want to use it, this is open to users, um, according to Jim. And you can go and, and try to do something if you want to. So um, so what people have been doing is stacking stacking. Uh, in this case, they put stack uh, graphene on uh, polydisulfide. And there's a twist angle that you can also measure, right? And we learned a lot about twist angles this year because of that big discovery. But uh, so you need to you can do all kinds of things like spectroscopy. 
And uh, there was a big discovery uh, at Physics World called the Breakthrough of the Year, where basically the, uh, Pablo Maria Herrero at MIT and his group uh, basically discovered the magic angle graphene uh, was able to go for ba basically being a Mach insulator to a superconductor with a twist angle. So that was a very nice result. And so there uh, a lot of activity uh, going on in that area. Okay, so now for some technical details of how you grow the materials. So these slides were uh, made by Amanda and showed them to you earlier, so you can thank her for, for these slides. So the basic idea, and this is how you grow most of the materials, is by, by vapor transport. And so you have a tube, you have some starting material, uh, so you have reactants, so you have a tube, you have reactant A, you have a transport agent B, you put them in a temperature gradient, uh, there's a reaction, A plus B goes to AB, and, and so the idea is that you you have one side, uh, a T2, a hot side, and a, and a cold side. And uh, essentially the reaction uh, uh, proceeds. So you have an equilibrium. And when you have a temperature gradient, uh, the Le Chatier principle uh, essentially has, if, if, your, if your reaction is endothermic, your crystals will grow at the cold end of the tube. And if the reaction is exothermic, crystals will grow at the hot end of the tube. Um, so there's a bunch of common transport agents that people use. Iodine, bromine, chlorine, all these things. So like, like uh, often, if you don't want to work with chlorine, you might try tellurium tetrachloride, which decomposes at a low temperature, puts chlorine in the tube, along with a little tellurium. In some cases, the tellurium, oops, in some cases, the tellurium won't hurt you. You might try it with uh, aluminum chloride. Um, typically, you want about a bar of pressure in the tube when you're, when you're growing. Well, how do you decide those transport agents? How do you decide? Yeah. Well, you can try to do some, you can either just try them, or you can try to do some uh, you know, chemical calculations. There's, there's different kinds of software where you can try to model reaction. Sometimes that works. Uh, it's typically easier just to just you know, put a bunch of tubes in the furnace and wait a week. I don't know. I mean, it depends how much you trust that software. <laughs> There's a lot of mistakes in those databases, and I don't know. Well, it's a good question if, uh, for instance, you're going to use HCL or, you know, or HF or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that seemed more serious. Yeah, no, I mean, so, you know, we're, we're at a small scale lab, right? University scale lab. We, we try to do things e as easily and inexpensively as possible. I think most of us are in that boat. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we don't like working with HCL and gases. But we could avoid it. So uh, vapor transport has been around for a long time. There's a lot of uh, sort of rules of thumb. Um, basically, you don't want to go too fast. Uh, rate of transport should not exceed the rate growth of the seed. So you got to adjust your gradient so you're growing at the right. Uh, there's a lot of empirical evaluation, you know, for your temperature, temperature and gradients. Uh, you want a nice large crystalliz crystallization chamber. You want a nice uniform temperature in your crystallization chamber. Uh, bigger tubes are better, generally. And if you're using a bigger tube, you probably want a, a smaller temperature gradient. So these are just rules of thumb that people have written down over the years. So Amanda has grown lots. This is just a handful of this kind of things she grows. Um, and so she has, she's developed a whole bunch of tricks uh, that she uses. And uh, so she basically um, does a lot of work in the glove box. Uh, she seals things under vacuum. So when she seals the tubes, She's careful to keep the bottom end of the cold, uh, the tube cold, so it doesn't volatilize anything when you, when you don't want it to. So she, I think she wraps it with a wet paper towel. <coughs> There's another trick that I heard about, and you can use like one of these, um, these, these uh, 
these um, dust off cans. So you know you can like you can. There's videos on the internet where you can like cool your beer with a, with a dust off. You flip it upside down and you spray it with the, the cold liquid that comes out. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So you could do the same on one of these tubes. You can like cool the tube with a dust off and, and then seal it. I haven't tried that one, but that's somebody was telling me that they might work. Um, so that's another another use for dust off. I don't think it kills the ozone layer anymore. <laughs> I know it used to. I don't know if we're using it there. Um, yeah, so you, you want to go slowly. Whenever you're working with things like sulfur and things and phosphorus, you, you don't want to heat it up too fast. Right? If you heat it up too fast, your tube will explode. Um, uh, you don't want to volatilize stuff. You want to react first. You want to react slowly. Yeah, so then, then uh, you, you basically want your nice uh, stoichiometric uh, powder before you get started with vapor. Um, another trick that she has is um, essentially if you just pour the powder in, it'll stick to the wall. So you want to put something uh, in the tube where the powder can get to the bottom without sticking along the walls. So that's another trick, and then she uses her wet paper towel. Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, how do you uh, worry about the iodine? I know that iodine, well, we don't have our experience that iodine can really ruin a pump if... Uh, yeah, we've ruined many pumps. Yeah. <laughs> so do you use a trap or something to... Yeah, you can. You can. Uh, you can put like a, a nitrogen trap. Um, That's what we do. Yeah. Nitrogen um, trap. Yeah, you could put a nitrogen trap in the line. Uh, good idea. <coughs> Maybe a sorption pump, but also I've been thinking about putting a sorption pump on the ceiling station. That might be a good idea. But yeah, no, it's harder than pumps. It's harder than pumps. The white paper towel. It helps a little bit. Yeah, it helps. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say you don't volatilize any iodine, but yeah, no, it's it's definitely hard on the pump. And a nitrogen trap would be a good idea. Uh, but uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, there's all. I mean, there's all kinds of little tricks like that. But, uh, so we tend to, um, and we use the cheap uh, mini mic. We don't have the fancy two-zone furnaces, because, but we have a lot of them. We've got like plenty of them. Um, okay, what else? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, you basically choose your tube legs to fit the furnace. Um, and so what we end up doing is, is calibrating, uh, basically measuring temperature gradients in the furnaces with thermal calculations. Uh, so you can you find a natural gradient in your furnace and you try to take advantage of it. Um, so that's I mean so these are the little furnaces that we tend to use. Um, it would be great if we could have lots of two zone furnaces, but these are cheap. These are like fifteen hundred bucks, so you can you can put them everywhere and they really fix them. But um, and they and they work on one ten as well. So you just plug them into one ten. So yeah, so you, you basically calibrate with thermal couples, you measure temperature gradients, and you can you can tune them, you can put in like little fire breaks here and there and try to tune the gradients and stuff like that. Um, so you, you, prop the, you prop the tube on some fire breaks. Uh, you've got your temperature gradient. And you know, depending on material, uh, it could take you know four days to over a month. There was uh, one calcogenite spinel, manganese, scandium. It took, I, I, I was reading, it took like three months for them to grow their crystal. This, this was a, I think it was an, an oil group. There was an earlier comment, made this comment here, that there was a growth that took 10 months. 10 months, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. 10 months. You, you, you had electricity for 10 months? <laughs> 
I, I, I think we lose electricity every two weeks. So that really <laughs> I don't know if we can go even a month. It seems like a long time to go without power. Uh, I don't know. I wish we had more reliable power, but we don't. Uh, you know. Is the power here pretty reliable? No. <laughs> no, we actually installed UPS power for yeah. For furnaces, we like, wow. Yeah, because you waste a lot, you can lose a lot of time. We've wasted a lot of time. If you're, you know, if you have a, you know, you know, three week growth going and you lose power after two weeks, you've lost two weeks and you lost all that money in the furnace. I mean, it's crazy. So you have it. That must be an enormous system to run furnaces on. I mean, yes. Tons of, a lot of lead acid batteries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. And uh, so then if you're patient, you get some beautiful crystals growing in your tooth. Um, so there's, there's various problems that you can try to troubleshoot. So crystals don't grow. You can try to you know, put more transfer agent in and reduce your temperature. You've got too many small crystals. Uh, you can you can try to clean the inside of your tube with nitric acid or some other kind of acid to try to reduce the number of nucleation sites in there. Um, you can sometimes this trick works. You can reverse the temperature gradient. Um, try to transport everything back and then try it again. Sometimes that works. So yeah, there's various uh, things to try to do when stuff is when it doesn't work quite the way you want. So here's some more crystals that were grown um, this way. So it works pretty well for the most part. Um, usually get pretty high quality stuff. And um, it's a gentle way of growing crystals. Right? Generally, the gentler you grow the crystal, the better it is. The lower the temperature you grow things, the better the quality of the um, High temperature methods usually produce more defects. So, so if you could grow something out of a flux versus a you know, high temperature furnace. Yeah. So like you're, you're probably going to compare. The differences in the cement hexafluoride grown, there probably are some differences. Right? You can grow cement hexafluoride in an optical furnace versus flux. And uh, I'd be curious. I bet there's some real differences. Uh, it's, yeah, it's going to be one of the topics. Yeah, no, I, I imagine it would be. So. 